All right, so uh, most of the uh, presentations today have dealt with modeling or uh, something associated with it. And we're going to change gears a little bit. We're going to speak about the results of the models, people putting practices in the ground, and then seeing exactly how well those things are working. And uh, my, my presentation follows pretty nicely Dr. Hoag's from, from before. Stormwater, of course, is an issue for numerous reasons, as have been discussed quite a bit today. Um, and what I want to do is talk about how many uh, about practices that are being put in the ground to try to limit issues with erosion and flooding and nutrient buildup, uh, and just look at how some snapshot of them are working. I'm going to focus on three specifically, permeable pavement, bioretention, and uh, if we have enough time, stormwater wetlands. So permeable pavement is precisely what it sounds like. Water flows through the surface and is then stored in underlying layers. It is a pretty common practice used across the globe. You can see some different places from Asia uh, to Europe to Australasia and then here in the United States. Um, but there is an issue with it in that there have been numerous uh, cases where it has been shown to clog. And if the system's clogged at the surface, then it's no longer going to be permeable. And so we have lots of good examples of bad pavement or clogged pavement. And so one of the things that we try to do is figure out where is this clogging occurring. And uh, the, the, there are people out there and, uh, that have been at, pretty hard at work. ASTM, in fact, has developed a couple of standards to test whether or not a pavement is clogged. You can see um, one of the tests here that's been used. And what we try to do is use those tests to see where this permanent pavement, for example, is being used, where is the clogging occurring. And you'll observe five different sites here, uh, one of which is very close to an impermeable surface. So that permeable, impermeable surface interface is something I'm going to uh, talk about quite a bit. Another one of those sites is also underneath the tree. And then you see sites four and five are essentially control sites. And what you'll see here, this is up in Ohio, by the way, what you'll see here is that the sites that are near the permeable, inter impermeable interface, as well as the site that's beneath the tree, was suffering from uh, lower infl surface infiltration rates after three months of testing. All right? The sites that essentially served as control had no, uh, no such change, just after three months. Um, another site, for example, in Cleveland that we've looked at, or in northern Ohio, you can see near the permeable, impermeable interface, a site that we tested is clogged. It's being overwhelmed by water as it comes off the adjoining impermeable surface. But by the time the water gets into the pavement, it's no, the, the surface is no longer clogged and the site disappears. And you see this repeatedly occurring. And so one of the things we were able to do at this site was we, was we actually ran a street sweeper in. Street sweeper came and basically tried to take out what was causing the clogging in the per pavement. And when the, when the street sweeper did, we were able to look at the results pre and post. And you can see here of the uh, eight different sites looked at, pre and post maintenance. Maintenance made a really big difference um, for all but three of the cases. And the three cases that it did not, um, one was in the site number four where the infiltration rate was already extremely high. And then the other two sites were the two sites that were closest to that permeable, impermeable interface, which suggests that at some point your paper can get so clogged that it's not able to be fixed. All right. So one of the things that we have taken from this is, is knowing that you can, you can, you can maximize you can, you, can, you can cross over a threshold with respect to the amount of impermeable pavement that flows onto permeable pavement to the point that eventually the system could clog. And that has a lot to do with future modeling scenarios when you try to figure out how much water I can actually send to permeable pavement if you want to make sure the thing is actually going to work over the course of the long term. All right, now I'm going to talk a little bit about bioretention, another very common practice used you, mostly in the United States, a little bit in Northern Europe, and Singapore, for example, has in Australia, Australasia has actually gotten pretty big into it as well. Um, the way it works is water, you can probably tell an engineer drew this, certainly not an artist. Um, the water fills it up during a rain event, it soaks into the ground, it's pulled out by an underdrain system, and you also get some amount of evapotranspiration. So bioretention is uh, basically a it's a, it's a landscape that's intended to serve a lot of stormwater purpose as well. So one of the things we were trying to do as part of one of our studies was to look at, and I'm not going to name the big box store that was willing to host us, but a big box store allowed us to do some testing at their site. And um, we were going to test two different types of media depth to see if that made much of a difference. But during the construction of the project, the bioretention cells, and this is a very real thing, the practices go in the ground before the site is stable. All right. 
And you can see here the parking lot was being constructed. You can see the crusher run, which is a standard, which is a, uh, a colloquial name for gravel with fines, all right, base associated with the pavement. And then as it rained, those fabrics, which are covering up the bioretention, were designed to capture those fines. And they did capture those fines, except that um, some of the fines and some of the sand was able to flow through. And you can see that thin gray line there in that picture, and that is a result of gravel fines coming off this lot during the course of construction. Well, you might guess then that this system did not drain like it was supposed to. All right, you can see here, right after a rainfall, the grad student goes back the next day, and there's still water in there. And in fact, if it were to rain now, there would not be vacated space sufficient, perhaps, to capture that upcoming rain, which is a bit of an issue. And you can see, based upon some measurements, some of the drawdown uh, rates that we observed um, at the site and what they were supposed to be. Okay, so what we did is we fixed it after a year's worth of monitoring. And what we found is we had to go in, knock out, basically clean out the top uh, 75 millimeters of media to basically remove that thin gray line. And we also, in, in the, by the process of doing that, increased our storage volume within the bioretention cell. And so it was a one day job where we had a contractor come out and actually do this work. And you can see the impact of that. If you take a look on the, uh, on the, the, the third, uh, the first and the third column, where we had, again, two different types of media being tested, I want to bring everyone's attention to the red bar, or what's in this case underneath the blue box. And that's the amount of water that was not treated at all. It's the amount of water that overflowed the device simply because it was not draining fast enough and the bowl was a little bit too small. And then by making one day's worth of repairs, we limited the cumulative overflow from you know, between 35 and 40 percent to just over 10 percent. And that, by the way, would be the LID target for North Carolina. Another thing that that did, uh, the fix did, is if you take a look at perhaps setting up a, a coefficient of, of discharge, um, we were able to pre and post, we were able to increase the, the uh, likelihood that storms would be more fully captured. In fact, we were able to double it, in fact, by doing this one day's worth of maintenance. And so clearly it's important that, these, that issues be identified and be corrected if the practices are in fact to deliver what they have been designed to and very often modeled to deliver. All right, which brings me to my third stormwater uh, control measure, and that is a constructed stormwater wetlands. Even though, even in Southern California example where it's quite dry, there's some very nice constructed stormwater wetlands even in LA County. And you can see them again used in Singapore, Sweden, and then in my home state of North Carolina. They're put in here for numerous reasons, um, certainly mitigating peak flow, reducing flooding is one of them. But part of the reason that they're, they tend to be favored is that they have an ability, based upon their inherent mechanisms, to remove nitrogen. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to test, of course, was maintenance key to a system that was working. And I'm going to show you a quick example of a stormwater wetland that um, was not very well maintained. You can see a, a photo there by Dr. Greenway in um, Queensland from Griffith University in Queensland. Australia, and you can see the outlet structure there on your right. Now, on the left was the wetland when it was built. On your right is the outlet structure um, that is basically clogged with flotsam or debris. And basically, this was allowed to stay clogged for about 10 years. So take a good look at the picture on the left. And without any inspection or maintenance, that wetland became that wetland. And very clearly, that is no longer a wetland. That's a wet pond with a few melaleuca trees struggling to survive. So we do know that maintenance, particularly outlet structure, is one of the things that we need to be mindful of. And so if you don't do maintenance, you know, you're going to build up debris. You're going to perhaps create a mosquito breeding ground. And um, it is important that if the outlet structure gets, is not maintained, then it's going to clog and cause legitimate issues with your practice. But something else is going on in a wetland that makes it different from a lot of other stormwater control measures. And then it's also maturing that as these plants are moving around, they're becoming typically, if, if, if maintenance, if clogging is not significant, you're going to get more establishment of vegetation over, of course, a better coverage, better root um, coverage. So this is the type of thing that we know that the vegetation is key within a constructed wetland, and that's something we might want to be able to take advantage of. So we had this unique opportunity to study the practice shortly after it was built in 2007, 2008. Then we waited five years, found a willing grantor, and we went back and studied it again. And you can see with the, how much the system had aged over the course of those five years, at least from a visual extent. 
And one thing that was unique about the site is it was not very well maintained. Now, during 2007, 2008, when we did the first study, North Carolina was in the midst of one of its significant droughts. Um, in 2012, 2013, we had a much more normal year for rain. Now, what did we find? Well, in 2007, 2008, when we were in the middle of the drought, the system was actually able to reduce volumes quite significantly, in fact, it was significantly and substantially, that 54% of the water that came in did not leave the outlet, whereas after, the, uh, the, after five years with a normal, normal rainfall record, um, we didn't see much of a change. In fact, we saw no change. From a peak flow mitigation standpoint, we did see flooding get reduced pre and post, even despite the fact we didn't have a substantial amount of maintenance. So why was that, you know, why did we see this significant difference or substantial difference between uh, the pre and post period, the pre and post uh, when, it, when it was installed and after a lack of maintenance? Well, certainly the fact that we had a longer antecedent dry period was important during the first monitoring period. But we also observed that a water table adjusted upward as, as, over the, uh, as a result of the breaking of the drought. And then we also observed that we had some accumulation, which is naturally going to be expected in a system like a wetland, all right? We did, as a result, though, of having the water stay around longer, um, we did see some improvements, particularly in dissolved species removal. For example, of nitrate nitrite, pre and post, the, early on, we didn't see any change in nitrite. After five years with the system maturing, we did. Other, other pollutants, like organic nitrogen, we didn't see any change. And you could argue that's simply because that the, the, uh, the concentrations coming in were below a typical threshold that, were norm that are normally discharged from naturally occurring wetlands. You can see the same type of situ situation with orthophosphate. Um, as water stays in the system, it has maybe more of a chance for the phosphorus to be removed. And then for other pollutants, you couldn't make any, any uh, conclusion because factors such as swales or whatnot were reducing sediment loading into the system after five years. All right, so long story short, as the system aged, we seemed to get a little bit better with respect to certain pollutants being removed. Other pollutants, there was not much of a change, um, which is, of course, really a good thing. And one thing to note is that all the effluent concentrations that we tested tended to be near what um, other practices were discharging at a lower threshold. So what was unique about this wetland? Well, one of the things that we can inform designers about is that, uh, namely, the outlet structure was, was actually clog resistant. It was a little hard for the system to clog based upon its design. It wasn't a beautiful design, but it was hard for it to clog. And that's going to be something that we think is going to be important. The site in Australia that I showed you earlier, when the thing clogged, the water level raised so high that it was able to drown most of the vegetation. So some take home points regarding this is that all practices need to be maintained to some extent. It's great to have models that are predictive of, of how they'll work, um, and I think that's important. Those models certainly can be informed to allow these systems not to work as well. Maybe uh, studies done in a lab or studies early on in a project suggest it's going to work at, let's say, 100 percent efficiency. Uh, maybe we assign in models more of a 50 or 60 percent efficiency. We also know that the more vegetated a system gets, the more resilient it tends to be. So once permeable payment's clogged, it's done. However, wetlands and bioretention have this healing mechanism associated with it. And if you do the right amount of inspection and maintenance, storm water control measure function certainly can get much, uh, can increase and, and the system can work for a longer period of time. We do have to make that investment though, for sure. And last but not least, the two major issues with low impact development type techniques are sediment exposure, basically blasting with too much loose sediment, and um, having the outlet get clogged, which I pointed out with the wetland earlier. I want to thank my research team, past and present, providing the uh, data I was able to present, and uh, I'm happy to entertain any questions we might have. Questions? That was great. Yes, sir. Not as much as, as they should be. You know, most of the time it's a developer that makes the decision as to what practice to put in the ground. And that developer is not going to be the long term landowner hardly ever. And so um, cities have the ability to steer practices, you know, to steer developments. Uh, still developers towards certain types of practices, but if it's just left to the developer, 
the maintenance typically is not is not a part of it. Yeah, it's an important point. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. The, that is actually the the not so pleasant story behind LID. And just to be honest, it's a lot easier to maintain a large constructed stormwater wetland that treats 100 hectares than it is to you know treat 150 uh, smaller practices. Um, it just, it, it, even though the in, even though those 150 practices require less maintenance from an economy of scale standpoint, and to answer your first question, I didn't present that in here, but um, basically the maintenance cost looks like it needs. To, if you're looking at a 30-year window, the maintenance cost should be twice that of the construction. cost. Basically, it's it's equal to the construction cost. All right. Thanks so much.